Trapped in the mysterious castle Amber, you find yourselves cut off from the world you know. The castle is fraught with peril. Members of the strange Amber family, some insane, some merely deadly, lurk around every corner. Somewhere in this castle is the key to your escape. But can you survive long enough to find it? This is the first adventure I ever played. In my memory, it was incredibly weird, but I have never read it, ever. We're going to go through it together and find out, was it really that weird or was it mostly just my memory? And I can't separate the experience of playing D&D for the first time in an environment where I felt like I was accepted and among friends and we were all doing something incredibly weird, but it also seemed amazing and unique and just perfectly dialed in for the kind of kid I was. I can't separate all of that from the actual adventure or separate that from all the changes my DM made. It all just sort of blends together into this amazing memory and experience. There was zero doubt that this was going to be the hobby I basically dedicated my life to. No regrets. You know, suddenly, in one afternoon, the walls between fantasy being something these people wrote, and which we all read, just exploded, and suddenly we were playing a fantasy story. But not like a video game where someone else decides what I can be and what I can do. The experience of playing D&D for the first time was this intense combination of being an author, the author of my character, and being in a fantasy novel. You know, the adventure had an author, but also RDM was sort of the author since they had to decide how to make this work. And that meant making a lot of authorial choices. Also, this adventure is sort of insane. And it's because of how crazy so many of these early adventures are that I thought you folks would get a kick out of finding out what's in here. But before we get started, I wanted to say, if for some reason this adventure sounds fun to you, there is an official remake for 5th edition from Goodman Games. You can get this in hardcover. I have no idea if it's any good. I just thought some of you folks might be interested in this. Anyway, let's get stuck in. This is Castle Amber, except it's also called Chateau d'Amberville, and it has this label, X2. Now, why the adventure has a French subtitle will be explained, but the X2 meant it was the second adventure in the Expert series which obviously would have meant nothing to me in 1986, but it meant this was an adventure for basic D&D, not AD&D. For about 14 years, there were two different versions, two different editions of D&D being produced simultaneously for reasons too complex to explain here. I got a whole video series on the history of D&D, links in the doobly-doo. And you would think that basic D&D was simpler and more straightforward than AD&D. No, they're both weird. Just weird in different ways, but also basically the same. I didn't know a lot of DMs in the 80s who cared about whether an adventure was for basic D&D or AD&D. We used the AD&D rules, but we grabbed whatever adventures seemed cool, and the differences between the editions were not obvious. So this is pretty typical of an 80s D&D adventure. It's 36 pages long, which seems short to me. You can see how thin it is. But the text is really tiny. It's about 1,100 words per page versus about 700 for a modern product. So it'd be about 56 pages today, even if you didn't change a single word, just from larger text, and 56 pages seems pretty beefy to me. The module says it should take about nine sessions to get through. I have no idea if that's true. They didn't really playtest stuff back then the way we do now. Also, I think folks leveled up a lot more slowly back then. You didn't assume that you would level up off of this. It might take three adventures, each one a self-contained story. You open it up and you get what seems to be boilerplate how to read a module text. So I suspect a lot of DMs skip this first page. But this is not standard how to read a module text because it gives you an overview of the module, which I'm not going to read right now, no spoilers. And it does have a lot of really good advice about being fair and impartial, but also not being afraid to kill a PC if they're being especially foolhardy. But then there's this interesting paragraph, which I wonder how many DMs skipped because they thought this was a generic intro. <clears throat> This module is not designed to be played completely in a single session. A number of gaming sessions will be needed to finish it. If the party tries to complete the entire module without stopping periodically to regain lost hit points and restore spells, they are quite likely to all die. Well, of course, you, you gotta rest. Super interesting that they didn't say without stopping to rest. It seems weird, but not as weird as what comes next. <clears throat> The party has an unknown powerful ally looking after them. Prince Stephen Amber will send a cloud of amber light to encircle the party at the end of each gaming session. What? 
The light will protect the party from all wandering monsters and provides nourishment. The amber light will also restore all lost hit points to wounded characters and allows magic users, elves, and clerics a chance to regain their spells. Am I going crazy? Why do we need to be protected from monsters between se- Does this adventure think the monsters can attack us between sessions? Holy shit. I thought you folks would be gobsmacked by this adventure, but even I didn't know this. I literally just now read this part. Man, I like the idea that the clock is always ticking, but not like this. Also, I just want to point out that the first paragraph now makes no sense, right? First, it says if we try to play through this entire adventure without resting, we'll die. But in point of fact, we can't do that because an orange mist puts us all in a stasis field that protects us from danger between sessions and heals us and gives us all our spells back. That's, that's insane. I'm pretty sure that didn't happen when we played, maybe because our DM skipped this first page thinking it was generic advice. Writing this script, I was completely gobsmacked by this, which led me down a rabbit hole of videos, including a quite good one from Super Geek Mike, and then another one from Questing Beast, links below. And it turns out this is a reference to something I was vaguely aware of, which was the fact that the original rules, somewhat obliquely, referenced the notion that the game was intended to be played in real time. Yeah, go watch those videos. I knew about the shared world part, which is sort of the reason they decided the game should be played in real time, but I never actually understood that they thought the game was to be played like an MMO. Except when you log out, your character sits there in the dungeon like a program in Tron, hoping their user returns before the oozes come. Really think the users are still there? They'd better be. We certainly never played that way. Anyway, after this very weird advice, we get some background on the adventure, and it turns out this adventure is adapted from a bunch of fantasy short stories published in the 1930s by a dude named Clark Ashton Smith, which, full disclosure, I basically know nothing about other than his stuff inspired this module. He invented this fantasy world called Avero, Averoin, Averion, Averoin, Averion, Averoin, which is medieval fantasy France. That's <laughs> that's cool. And this adventure was actually made with permission from Clark Ashton Smith's estate, which is also cool. But because the module is called Castle Amber and has these princes running around in it, I always thought it was an homage to the Chronicles of Amber from Roger Zelazny, which I also haven't read. Well, it turns out it's both. It is a mashup, basically, of Averio, Avero, I know how to start saying that word, but I don't know how to stop. And Nine Princes in Amber. I'm not going to talk about the Ember books. You can go look them up. They are weird. So this was my first experience with D&D, an adventure that is a mashup of two different fantasy series, neither of which I'd ever heard of. Remember what I said about take the stuff you like and put it in your game? That's how the game was run officially since it started. Anyway, we're not going to read this whole module together, but let me read you the boxed text from page three. This is the read this to the players section. And I hope you are sitting comfortably because it's pretty long. <clears throat> Your party has been traveling overland to Galantry City, tracking down rumors that one of the princes of Galantry is looking for brave adventurers willing to undertake a special mission. For a suitable fee, of course. Okay, notice that the why are we doing this stuff, what's my motivation, is all covered in the box text. This adventure assumes your characters heard these rumors and decided to chase after them, and your characters made this decision off screen. Moving on. You were especially eager to receive this commission because the princes of Galantry are noted, vowels, are noted for their generosity, not only with money, but also with magical gifts. Okay, this makes sense, especially if you remember that you got experience points for every gold piece you found, so money was a big deal. Continuing. Leading pack mules laden with supplies, you have been following a river that the local inhabitants assured you would lead you to Galantry City. Unfortunately, no hired guide was available, and either the directions given you were wrong, or you have taken the wrong fork by mistake. At any rate, you have good reason to suspect that you are lost, and you will have to retrace your route tomorrow. Okay, so A, we decided to go to this city off screen, and then B, we got lost off screen. And people complain about railroading now? The sun is setting and it is time to make camp. The most defensible campsite is on a nearby hill. 
The night passes safely, though everyone's sleep is plagued with nightmares. When the sun finally rises, you stare out at a world gone mad. Instead of the hill where you made your camp last night, your bedrolls now lie in the foyer of an ornate mansion. A freshly swept carpet graces the floor. The walls are decorated with bright, colorful tapestries. Brass candelabras line the entranceway. They show signs of having been recently polished and are filled with candles. More frightening than the sudden change from the wilderness to a mansion is the smoky gray mist which surrounds the mansion at a distance of 30 feet, blocking all sight beyond. No sound penetrates the mist. A mule, which accidentally wandered into the mist, was quickly lost to sight, though its lead rope was clearly visible at the edge of the mist. When the rope was hauled back in, the dead body of the mule was dragged back into the sunlight. What killed the mule cannot be determined, but it died with a horrible look of pain on its face. The mist advances on the mansion even as the party watches, but luckily it does not enter the foyer. The double doors of the interior swing open into the main hallway by themselves. Okay, so... My first adventure took place in a pocket universe surrounded by a deadly gray mist that kills anything that tries to leave the mansion. I mean, it could be that it's only deadly to mules. Maybe the mule was like super old and died of natural causes. <laughs> also, this adventure comes out in 1981. Ravenloft comes out in 1983. So obviously the idea of trapping the players in a pocket universe from which they have to find a way to escape was for some reason in the zeitgeist. I'm actually surprised they need the gray mist. Why not just lock the heroes in? They start in the foyer. You've already railroaded the hell out of them. Let them explore a little and find out they're trapped. This is a very old school adventure, and that is obvious in big and little ways. But one of the hallmarks of these old school adventures is the boxed text, also known as the read this to the players text. Now, I suspect that box text arises from the people designing the game feeling like you, the DM running it, would screw it up if you had to describe all this stuff. Better let the author handle that. But also, talking to folks online, it is equally obvious that the box text is hugely useful for new DMs who sort of, they bought the bike and they understand wheels and pedals and braking, but actually riding the bike is still a daunting task. Box text in that context really helps new DMs get into the swing of things. But even experienced DMs like it when an adventure at least breaks out what do the players see into its own section. And having done it all, I've run adventures with box text, without. I've designed adventures with box text, without. And I've improvised entire sessions. I do find that the worst scenario is one where the author takes everything in this room, or, or place, or even just scene, and puts it all into one big text dump that's actually a huge pain in the ass for the DM to read and understand because you're using language to describe these three-dimensional locations, often with very complicated topologies, and there's no correct way to do this, but there are often lots of wrong ways to do it. Trying to tease out, yeah, 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 but what do the players see? What is obvious can be a huge pain in the ass when an information is not called out. So. Whether you just call it box text or just what do the heroes see, I think we need that information broken out from the details of the room. Ultimately, the biggest problem with box text, and this may just be bad box text, is that it creates a dichotomy between what the author knows and what the DM knows. I can't tell you how many times I've read box text to players who didn't understand it, asked me questions, and made me realize I don't understand it either. I tried running a big Castle Greyhawk pastiche once that I really wanted to like. I spent weeks prepping it, because it's like 700 pages. But once I actually tried to run it, I discovered that none of the descriptions made literal sense, and I couldn't tease out what the 3D space was supposed to look like. I would read the box text to my players, and they would scratch their heads and ask questions, and I couldn't answer them. And the diagrams didn't help, because even with a 2D map, it's trying to describe a 3D space. And the one does not easily map onto the other. That's the danger of box text. It can be a useful tool, like me, but it can also lead you astray. Moving on. The module describes the castle as lavish, and it presents a wandering monster table. It tells the DM to check for wandering monsters once every two turns, which I think means every 20 minutes, because a round in AD&D was one minute and a turn is 10 rounds. The idea that one round of combat is one minute never made any sense to anybody I know. People have tried explaining it to me, Oh, it's abstracted and zoomed out. But none of these explanations really made sense with the movement rules or how much progress you make in a round. It didn't make sense to us in 1986. It still doesn't. 
I assume it is left over from some earlier wargaming rules, maybe chainmail, maybe something earlier, and they never bothered to change it because they wanted D&D to live in that space rather than become its own thing. I mean, they didn't even call it a role-playing game for several years, and when they did, that was controversial. The Wandering Monster chart is interesting because there are several NPCs on it. All of them are members of the Amber family, as well as living statues, which I assume are like golems, except these come in crystal form. Pretty cool. The members of the Amber family you might run into are listed, but only their stats. So presumably, they just try to kill you? We never get any real advice on how to run these characters or what they want. So it's sort of strange that they're so important to this adventure. But after this, we get the first real chunk of the adventure the West Wing of Castle Amber, and the first encounter. Now, you sort of have to see how the map works for this to make sense, but instead of coming in through a main entrance that leads to several different wings of the castle, you come in through basically a back door. This seems like something they would do to restrict player choice early in the adventure. Eventually, I think we get to a branch, but for now, we are going to explore the West Wing linearly. I'm not sure I realized this because I don't remember a lot about playing through this adventure, but it is obvious to me from the first encounter that Castle Amber is... You know what? I'll just read you the box text and you'll see. Uh, I'm not going to do this for every room, but I want you to get a feel for it. The room is luxuriously furnished with plush chairs, polished wood tables, ornate rugs, and other fine furniture. The furniture has been pushed back against the walls, and the carpets have been rolled up. In the middle of the floor, an impromptu boxing ring has been set up. In one corner of the ring, a man stands still as a statue with his hands raised in the boxing guard position. This man is wearing amber silk trunks. You notice that his skin has an unreal quality. Seated near the boxer is a man dressed in colorful silks, fancy lace, and rich velvets. He also wears a large brim hat flaunting a peacock's feather. A jeweled rapier is slung on his right side on a supple leather baldric. He has wavy black hair and a closely trimmed beard, which comes to a point. They don't say where the point is, so I assume it's that comes to a point. Two men in plate mail carrying halberds stand as guards on either side of the richly dressed man. The guard's flesh has the same unreal quality as the boxer's. The seated man's flesh does not have this quality. While the chairs have been pushed back, they all face toward the boxing ring. Floating above the center of each chair is a pair of red, unblinking eyes that turn to watch you. So, yeah, this is a funhouse dungeon. I did not know that. I have almost no memories of playing this adventure, but that's okay, because I didn't know what a funhouse dungeon was back then anyway. As far as I knew, this was bog-standard D&D. The man dressed in colorful silks is Jean-Louis d'Amberville. He has no background, no motivation, there is no explanation for why he is here or doing these things. As far as I can tell, this entire adventure is just a series of disconnected vignettes featuring characters with no obvious motivation and no real character. They are literally just here to challenge the players. They're basically puzzles, except not really. I mean, this encounter is actually exactly what it seems. There's no trick. The players can decide to fight the boxing homunculus, and there are special rules for boxing. If they do well, they can win a lot of money. And money, remember, is XP back in the 80s. They can also just ignore it and leave. Go on to the next room. I have a vague memory of trying to ask these people questions and the, the GM just being silent or repeating something this NPC said, and I think that was pretty normal. The GM is given no information with which to roleplay these characters. So they're not characters, they're just elements of the vignette. It's almost like the entire adventure is one big programmed illusion. Everyone in it is just going through the motions with no sense of past or future. And we were okay with this. I mean, we were kids. I'm not going to go over every encounter in this kind of detail. That would take forever and it would be pretty tedious. Instead, I just want to highlight some of the weirder encounters. There's a room with six Rakshasas, except they're called Rakastas. As far as I can tell, this is the first time the Rakshasa makes an appearance in D&D. Uh, there's no... You just fight them. If you try to talk to them or negotiate with them, the DM would have to invent everything, including who they are exactly, why they're here, and what they want. There's a banquet hall filled with ghosts. Not ghosts you can fight, by the way, just, just apparitions. If the players decide to sit and eat the food, they discover that the 10-course meal has some surprises. If they try the onion soup, they have to save or gain hit points permanently. I'm not sure how often I've seen an ability where nothing happens if you save and something good happens if you fail. I think they did this so the players would learn that success could be good or bad and failure can be good or bad. 
so the players never know exactly whether it's a good idea to interact with things. If they try the amber wine, the character is fully healed, restored, and cured of all disease. If they try the salad, one of their stats, picked randomly, goes up by one or two, and another random stat goes down by one or two. This is classic funhouse nonsense. I remember a lot of these kinds of encounters in the 80s. I remember one adventure, and I hope this is real and not just my faulty memory playing tricks on me, with a different colored pools and touching the water in the pools forced a save. One of our friends wasn't around that afternoon, so we decided his character would jump in all the pools. When he returned next week, his human ranger was now a one-armed, hairless gnome. <laughs> it's possible that's something we made up as an example of how ridiculous these adventures are, but I hope not. If you try the roast beef... Five, four, three, two, one, beef. Nothing happens. It's just tasty beef. Beef. If you eat the bread, either you save and you never need to eat again, or you fail and now you need to eat twice as much from now on forever. Yeah. If you eat the green beans, nothing happens. Just like real green beans. If you eat the mushrooms in wine sauce, either you save and gain plus four to all of your saves against poison permanently, or you fail and die. Just like real mushrooms. If you drink the wine, which you can't if you failed your mushroom save, you're drunk for 2d6 turns. This is just one encounter. If you eat the apple strudel, you save or gain ESP. Nothing happens if you make your save. If you drink the brandy, which you can't if you failed your mushroom save, you either save or become a ghost and permanently join the apparitions at the table. This is only the third encounter. There's a room where the entire floor is a two foot deep giant green slime and the ceiling is a giant black pudding. Do we even have green slimes anymore? If you can get past all that, there is a box with an intelligent sword inside, but the box is covered in gray ooze. Why? There's an ogre in here wearing a silk nightdress who is convinced it's Janet Amber and will act accordingly. Don't ask why. It's gross, actually. You know what this reminds me of, actually, for real? It reminds me a lot of the Xanth books by Piers Xanth. Actually, uh, it reminds me of all of his stuff. The Apprentice Adept books, the Incarnations of Immortality. They were huge when I was a kid. We read all of them. And they have this same random, almost vaudevillian tone where the characters have no depth. They're just there to sort of surprise and entertain the reader until the next scene. It is a very fairy tale logic style, which you know, I have a lot of affection for, actually. I think that stuff is probably more appropriate when you're a kid. There is an entire forest in here with a bunch of evil ants, except they're called killer trees. There's a maiden and a unicorn in here asleep. Uh, basically a recreation of one of the unicorn tapestries, except the maiden is actually a gold dragon for some reason. Uh, no explanation. No idea what her personality is or why she's here. It's not a puzzle. It's just this thing. This moment. This scene, really. Like pictures at an exhibition. Castle Amber is more like an art gallery with different pictures depicting completely unrelated scenes. Except every once in a while, it's save or die versus the mushroom soup. Remember when I said fairy tale logic? I wrote that into the script after reading about the ogre. So then I'm reading further and... There's a bridge across a stream in the middle of the forest, in the middle of the castle. The players watch as a billy goat satyr politely asks a troll hiding under the bridge if he can cross. Yeah, literally a fairy tale. Also, there is a fountain of death. Not gonna tell you what that does, but right after it, there is a, a, an acorn tree with six squirrels living in it. And these squirrels are each a little furry King Midas because everything they touch turns into gold as long as it's an acorn. That is a very specific superpower. <laughs> so you get to fight some squirrels, because that's fun, I guess. But if you beat them, they have 2,000 gold worth of tiny golden acorns. And remember, a big part of old school play was just, how are you gonna get all this gold and silver and copper out of the dungeon? In fact, if you read these old school adventures, there's often an astonishing amount of gold in them, which seems even crazier when you know that gold was XP back then. But the authors assumed the DM took encumbrance seriously and just getting the treasure out of the dungeon so that you could count it as XP was a major challenge on its own. There's also basically the poppy field from Wizard of Oz. There's a room with holes in the ceiling specifically engineered to be poked at with your party's 10 foot pole. Like a bunch of pinatas hidden in the ceiling. Some are just bladders full of water that burst and get you wet but are otherwise harmless. Some have killer bees 
or a cockatrice falls out. You thought getting thousands of pounds of gold home was hard, try getting your petrified teammate home. Especially when you're down one teammate because they got turned to stone. I'm skipping a ton of stuff, but there's a fortune teller with a unique version of the deck of many things. Outcomes include insanity, monkey lung, feeble mind, armpit homunculus, a mug that detects lies, all your money disappears, save or die, and testicular cranberrying. Are all those real? Only one way to find out. You also meet the Green Knight. Yeah, this guy, along with the Red Knight, whose treasure is a pool of molten gold, which, by the way, is about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Is it treasure or a way to die? First one, then the other. There's a room full of wolfmen. Not werewolves, just dudes with wolf heads. Who are they? What are they doing here? Who does their taxes? Shut up! It's 1981, there's still lead and gasoline. There's a dungeon, because of course there is, with what looks like a Sator square, but it's just five nonsense words, which if you walk on, you get a bonus. Especially if you like being a werewolf. Not a dude with a wolf's head, a werewolf. And you could also go insane, but it's a different insanity than any of the other insanities, because of course it is. There's a jail down here with a man, a minotaur, and an invisible stalker in it, except the minotaur is an illusion for no reason. There's a Frankenstein's laboratory down here with one of these in it. This is a brain collector, which seems to be in a lot of D&D products, actually. But I think Castle Amber is where it came from. There's a room with a bunch of vats for growing people in. Or they're not like people. They're like people-shaped golems called Majin. Actually, pretty cool. Uh, very Jack Vance kind of thing. There's an alchemical laboratory where the doors close and lock and 20 clouds of black lotus dust pours out of the ceiling and you have to breathe it in. And when you do, you fall asleep and dream. And this is one of the coolest things in this module, or uh, almost, because the adventure says the DM should make up a dream for each character and then the dream comes true. Like, here's one dream. <clears throat> a winged god or goddess visits the character and decides to give the character the gift of flight. The character sprouts wings and soars among the clouds. The character will wake up with real wings if the save is not made. Here's what would have made it really cool. If the DM just asked the players what dream their characters have, just let them invent something without knowing it's actually going to come true when they wake up. That, that would be... That is the kind of thing you can literally only do in a TTRPG. No video game could do that. Let the players just invent their own dream, and then some element of it becomes true when they wake up. There's a slime worm in here, which is basically a purple worm, except slimy. There's a room with a pentagram painted on the floor, and inside the pentagram, a death demon. I don't know what that is, but I, I, I'm pretty sure it does death. There's a pit full of ghouls. Why is it full of ghouls? Well... That's interesting because this is one of the few times in this adventure where there is actually an explanation for why things are the way they are. The pit is full of ghouls because the pit has a passageway at the bottom of it that leads to the Empire of the Ghouls. What is that? Where is it? The adventure says, that's up to you. Well, actually, what it says is, while the land of the ghouls plays no part in this adventure, the DM can create an underground labyrinth and a ghoul kingdom to supplement the adventure if he or she or she so desires. The thing I think is sort of absurd is the idea that, oh, sure, you could whip up a maze and a ghoul kingdom if you feel like it, as though those two things are about as hard as each other. Just, you know, walk down to the corner store and then fly to the moon. It's like, hang on, one of those things is not like the other. The whole point of this adventure up until now has been locating three silver keys the heroes can use to escape Castle Amber. And I'm pretty sure our GM just let us go back to the campaign at that point. But in fact, that's just the end of Act 2 in the adventure. Act 3, the silver keys don't get you home. They get you out of the castle and into the fantasy universe of... It's this little mini campaign world. It's about 216 miles across and 500 miles long. It's got its own map and terrain and points of interest. And it's sort of insane that this entire little world is included to support about five pages of content that amounts to like four encounters. One of the encounters, by the way, involves stopping a colossus from destroying a castle, the event depicted on the cover. That's right. This castle here isn't even Castle Amber, and this scene probably never happens because you sort of have to stop the Colossus or the adventure grinds to a halt. 
The idea is the silver keys get you out of Castle Amber and into the world beyond, where there are four magic items you need to collect, a sword, a mirror, a ring, and a potion. Once you collect all the plot coupons, you can redeem them for a ticket to another pocket universe, an infinite featureless void with only the tomb of Stephen Amber in it, and then you have to explore that tomb. The tomb includes a blue dragon, a salamander, a wyvern, a stone giant, another intelligent sword, a manticore, a mud golem, a great white shark, and a hydra. Should you get past all this, you find the crypt of Stephen Amber. There's a tapestry here and an instruction from Stephen Amber to burn it. If you burn it, he rises from the smoke and ash of the burned tapestry and says, thanks, I've been in there for ages. That's the end, folks. You are immediately teleported back to your normal campaign world. D&D, everybody. Before the adventure wraps, you get to watch as the castle disintegrates while time finally catches up with it. If you remember earlier, I said the people in here act more like programmed illusions than characters. Well, it turns out that is literally true. They're just repeating the same actions over and over. And there's this subtext that they're really Stephen Amber's idea or memory or even commentary on his relatives. It's weird. Have I mentioned that? It is very, very weird. One of the things about the narrative of these old school adventures is that they didn't really need to make sense. If you were 15 when you went through this adventure, you might think the story was bad or poorly thought out, but as long as you got a bunch of dope loot, you didn't care. That fact that players judged adventures on these two different criteria with some players wanting stories that were plausible and rich with human emotion, and others who didn't really care what the story was actually, the weirder the better for these players because it gave them something interesting to interact with while they searched for loot, that dichotomy was a major problem in the hobby back then. I think almost every table had players who really wanted plausible, grounded narratives and others who just wanted Diablo. I think I've told this story before, but a friend of mine introduced me to Hero Quest years after it came out. Hero Quest is a Gloomhaven style dungeon crawling board game, except imagine no story. Everything is just random dungeon encounters. My friend said, when this came out, we stopped playing D&D. This was all we wanted. That blew my mind because we were good friends with really similar backgrounds, but that statement told me that we were super different. He probably would have loved Castle Amber because he didn't want a story or a narrative. He just wanted to kill monsters, get loot, and level up. Throwing wacky scenarios and puzzles in front of him while he did so just makes everything more entertaining. However weird I think this whole thing is, it was less weird back then for a lot of reasons. This is a subject for a whole different video, but a lot of fantasy and science fiction came out of short story writing. Most of the 20th century, fantasy and science fiction was dominated by short stories published in magazines. And they often had these Twilight Zone-esque plot twists and fairy tale logic. The scenario, the what if, was way more important than three-dimensional characters. So the fantasy novels we were reading, with some notable exceptions, often just focused on getting ideas, cool ideas onto the page. Forget character or plot, just entertain the reader and move on. Because it was all disposable, I don't think anyone, including the authors, imagined that books like Elric or Xanth would become evergreen and my friends would be reading them years later. That's it, folks. That's the video. Not a running the game video, not a product update, just something I thought you folks would get a kick out of. If this video does well, I'll, I'll do more of these, but this is not an infinite series. There's only a handful of old school adventures I wanna talk about. Next video, we're gonna hang out with my internet neighbor and old Norse specialist, Dr. Jackson Crawford, while I ask him about language and YouTube and you know just anything else that comes up. Thanks for watching, folks. If you wanna support the channel, I very strongly recommend coming by our Patreon, where we are currently live blogging the development of our own original RPG. There's not a lot of that right now because we're still full time on Flea Mortals and Arcadia, but not only do you get these dope developer diaries, you also get like, I, I don't know what it is at this point, 25 issues of Arcadia and more to come, all for just eight bucks a month. Not a bad deal. Until next time, folks, peace out.